Welcome to the Tourism Hub podcast, a podcast devoted to you and your excellence, providing inspiration and education for the entrepreneurs, experience makers and excellent seekers of our industry to take your tourism business and career to a whole new level. And I am your host, Despina Karatius. And uh, welcome to the Tourism Hub podcast. It's such a pleasure to have you here. Now, today's episode is a little bit different. Today, we've got a featured series of guests from Simon Westaway, from ATIC, Garth Laitgen, and we've got Michelle Lester-Smith. Now, this was a panel discussion that I facilitated for the wonderful people at Young Tourism Network. So it was all centered around making a comeback and how you can help carry the load as we return to normal and those itching to resume traveling, beginning planning their next getaway and the, with the tourism and events industry in industries needing to be ready to support their guests and their visitors. So on this episode, we looked at really, uh, we had a great discussion uh, from leading minds in the industry. So I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. And thank you to Young Tourism Network for having me facilitate the discussion. And thank you to the special guests. Uh, so without further ado, here is what was called the Digital Digest on the Young Tourism Network. And to find out more, you can always visit youngtourismnetwork.com.au forward slash making a comeback. Uh, It's an excellent network. I would encourage any young or not so young, but anyone with a look entering, taking those first steps to enter the tourism industry. The Young Tourism Network is open for all ages. It's more if you're young in your professional development and want to make some new connections and also have exposure to some experts and mentors throughout the way. So I would register for their email, become a member, uh, come to their events. A lot of them have been virtual and uh, as things open up uh, and you're in Melbourne uh, or Victoria, that would be a high recommendation to come along and join the team at YTN. So until next time, enjoy the episode and thank you again to our friends from the Young Tourism Network. For those of you who are new to one of these events or don't know much about the Young Tourism Network, YTN aims to provide students and those already working in the tourism, hospitality and events industries the opportunity to learn and grow through professional development workshops and networking opportunities and at the same time build strong relationships across the broader industry. Today we are joined by four wonderful guest speakers who you should be able to see on your screen somewhere. So there's Simon Westaway from the Australian Tourism Industry Council, Michelle Lester-Smith, formerly from G Adventures, Garth Laitgen from William Angelis Institute, and Despina Karatsias from the Institute of Excellence. Together, they will discuss the topic of making a comeback and how you can help carry the load. When life begins to return to a new normal, the tourism and event industries need to be ready to support those itching to begin planning their next getaway and resume travelling. Adapted event operations and travel habits could result in new varied styles of visitation and is a perfect opportunity to provide visitors with further responsible travel options. For instance, supporting the local regions, their economies, health and environment. Join us as we discuss how to make a responsible return after our period in hibernation. Feel free to type any questions you might have as we go along in the chat so that our speakers can answer them during the Q&A at the end. And you can also stick around for some networking afterwards. Now, without further ado, I'll hand over to our guest speakers to introduce themselves. 
So first up, we have Simon. Um, g'day guys, how are you going? Uh, welcome. Um, I'm braving my uh, courtyard, so hopefully it doesn't get too chilly. But um, uh, thanks for the opportunity uh, to uh, speak to you um, to this evening. And um, I'll just do a very quick introduction and um, I understand we're addressing a number of series of questions. Um, uh, I'm, regrettably, I have to um, push off at about 6.30, 25 to 7. I've got parent-teacher interviews. Um, so uh, I've got one particularly problematic child, so uh, I, better, I better sit in on those. But, um, but you can um, obviously, um, I have my details through the, uh, the, the network and if you do need some any extra questions, please do so. Look, um, I'm, the tourism and visitor economy is an area I'm very passionate about. I've been very fortunate to have worked in it for a, a reasonable part of my career and, um, and maybe a misfortune to sort of roll back into it in the last year or two with the problems that are now before us. But um, it's always, quite frankly, has always been my biggest passion point in terms of my career and where it's, where it's gone. And um, it's one of the things I do like to do is try to give back a little bit um, to industry as I move forward. I've got a couple of grey hairs now. I'm not that old, but, uh, but yeah, really keen to um, share some insights. So look, just briefly, I, um, I came into this industry through the aviation sector. So I've, being part of um, two airline groups in Australia. I was one of the startup executives, senior executives of Jetstar, working directly with Alan Joyce uh, back in the test tube, um, and then with the launch of that in 2004, 25th of May 2004 to be exact, um, and spent seven and a half really great years with JQ, um, and an interesting 40% compound growth of that airline over the period. Uh, I've uh, spent uh, time at Tourism Australia. I headed strategy and corporate affairs and oversaw the China strategy, Tourism 2020, from our perspective and a number of other initiatives. Thoroughly enjoyed the work. I really, quite frankly, still be, still be there today, but I went off and, and pursued other things. Um, and I guess I've had this fortune. I consult to corporates and uh, um, companies that need help or people that are going places and uh, uh, I work very closely with um, tourism, number of tourism clients, and I work um, for the Australian Tourism Industry Council, which is an SME-led um, federated model with our, obviously, our state and territory ticks, which I'll no doubt there are perhaps a couple of our members are on, on, online today. So that's, that's uh, me in a nutshell. Three kids, wife, live in Melbourne, so loving DEFCON 4. <laughs> and Michelle, did you want to... Yeah. Yeah, so um, yeah, thanks so much for having me. Um, yeah, really appreciate it. Um, yeah, so I was lucky enough to start my tourism career almost 15 years ago. Um, so I applied for a job with AOT Inbound in product, which was back then the Australian Outback Travel Company, really not having any idea what I was getting myself into at all with the industry. Um, but yeah, had a really amazing team who supported me and, and literally, as corny as it sounds, fell in love with the industry. Um, I was then asked to work with other businesses in the States with outbound tourism, so Australia, New Zealand, South Pacific and also Africa, and moved there and then consulted from there, um, or from Canada actually, for the next five years. Um, I was then lucky enough to go for travelling for over a year and then settled back in Melbourne when I started working at APT uh, with the Kimberley and Outback, so um, all their product, um, so more from a tour operator perspective, and moved up into a product manager role looking after that whole region. Uh, the role was really diverse, work, working across um, the destination with marketing, sales, operations and finance, which sort of gave me a bit of a, a broader understanding of the whole business side of tourism, and, um, which from there I actually got an opportunity to work with a, um, essentially a guy who owned 24 light aircraft and an outback pub in South Australia <laughs> and working from home mostly, but also got the incredible opportunity to fly around a lot of spectacular Outback Australia. So really, really fortunate with that role, but uh, started out as product development, but evolved more into building long-term strategies for the business um, and looking at marketing, sales, distribution, and also the infrastructure of the town. Um, and then from there, I uh, was offered a role with GA Ventures under a restructure with the global product team, looking after their Oceana product, um, which is where I really started focusing on the sustainability and community tourism aspects of the industry, which I'm probably most passionate about, I would say. Um, and then most recently I've been hosting a webinar series. So I've been doing a lot of these lately with um, Travel Daily and the Travel Industry Hub, um, working with operators on how they can survive and how they are reviving post-COVID. So, yeah, it's me in a bit of a nutshell. Wonderful. Welcome, Michelle. And Garth, have we got Garth there? Yes, I'm here. Um, thank you for having me. That's been a pleasure. 
Um, well, I'm going to go back to where I first started. I started studying accounting, um, um, in, and that was uh, an interesting topic. And uh, I didn't really want to do accounting, but I, I did it anyway. Something to do. And then um, I got itchy feet, and I start, I went travelling, and I based myself in London. And uh, I did the London thing. I worked in the pub. So this is a bit of a five-star pub, and I started as a dishwasher. Um, did some function waiting, and I loved the function. I loved entertaining people and having um, them having fun with me. And then also I the, the club turned into, or the restaurant turned into a nightclub. So I did a bit of busy work and some bar work, and I, I just, it was just, I just had a great time. And I was also doing um, an accounts role as well, and a full-time position while I was in London. So I was going, I was in it, in London on and off. Uh, but working and constantly working, but I, I did love the the bar work, um, and that was sort of the, the seed planter for my career in events. Uh, I didn't realise it at the time, and when I did travel, um, I went, went to about forty countries. Um, but the constant theme was uh, festivals and entertainment that I was following, like running of the bulls or the beer fest, um, and the music festivals. Um, or was adventure like safaris and so forth. So there was a general theme there. Again, wasn't quite sure that's what I was into, but that's what I was following. Uh, but I came back in 96, got myself a corporate job. Um, so still um, going to all the festivals and uh, introduced nightclubs to my genre of entertainment and um, turned out to be a full-time worker as, as well as a, a person that went to nightclubs full-time as well. And... Um, um, then I started running my own event. I put an event in 98, um, so in 99, sorry, and um, I was using successful and I had a big dilemma. Do I keep the corporate job or do I follow something that I really love and passionate about? And, and then in December 99, I said, that's it. I'm hanging up my corporate hat, giving, handing over my corporate car and my office, and I'm going to give this event career a go. And really haven't looked back. Um, since then, um, working on festivals like Rainbow Serpent when it first started, Earthcore, um, they were sort of the, the ones. Also ran a lot of nightclub events and ran some nightclubs. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. And then in 2012, I had a bit of a uh, career change. I had enough of events, but still loved it. Um, so I decided to go back to school, get my education in events, get my teaching um, um, and um, set for in teacher training. And then I started my first ship at William Anglis on a Friday, um, teaching finance and event management. Um, so that was just one day a week. And then over the eight years, full time, which it was last. And so now I've been put myself back into school um, to um, perfect my craft as a teacher. Um, so that's where I'm at now. I still work on events, um, but this year I've written 2020 off for myself personally to run any events and just really um, doing a bit of internal researching and how I can re reinvent myself for, um, for 2021 moving forward. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Garth. And thank you to all our wonderful speakers. Speakers. My name is Despina Kratzius. Uh, I guess we have a lot in common and how lovely is it to be coming together tonight. We miss networking, don't we? So congratulations yeah. to Young Tourism Network. This is such a fantastic mm -hmm. event to put on for of our industry and you can see you've got access to some amazing thought leaders in our industry here. My background is certainly I have and there's a theme of aviation in the group. My first gig out of, out of, uh, out of school was with Kendall Airlines so it was a subsidiary of ANSET if anyone can remember Kendall. So that gave me my first exposure in place making, experience making and the inner workings of a a tourism business. We were a small wholesale business at the time. But as I went through the journey, hotels and crews, all different facets of the distribution of our, our industry. Um, on the supplier side, I landed in a different type of aviation, and that was with the hot air balloon business, Global Ballooning here in Victoria. 
and that was my biggest it, it's it's 17 years we're coming up to of having that journey but in during that time i've had a chapter one and the chapter two with global ballooning but now i'm well and truly a balloon girl for life um but during that time i've entered into the i, I took the journey of also teaching and training and started my boutique training business institute of excellence in 2014 really imparting knowledge to the small tourism operator and uh, it's really making that my obsession is really helping small tourism operators transition from small to smart and at the moment i am um, i'm heading up a wonderful organization you may have heard of tourism tribe and also um and navi digital so navi digital is extending what we do in the tourism space to now spread our own wings and help small businesses across the country so i was just saying to the team earlier i'm i'm seeing businesses all over australia and i feel like even though i'm in stage four lockdown i feel i've, I've, I've gone to south australia today northern territory and uh, brisbane which is all exciting so we're all in an exciting industry we need to stay motivated and uh and what a timely topic to be talking about making a comeback and how can we can all carry the load to make a contribution to make this comeback uh the best ever we're going to start with simon hello simon hello, hello. So I will be facilitating some questions for you guys. So we're going to start with you and how you see a COVID clean travel experience. And we're not just talking masks. How else will this look for travellers, both domestically and internationally? Yeah, look, thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, we were preceded with these, but it was a really good question to have a good think about. And um, I think this is one of them um, because amount of level of investment in 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 the visitor economy tourism aviation airports and the like so the empire will fight back so for those of you that are studying at the moment i stick in this industry i mean this industry so just keep a couple of these stats australia was valued 152 billion dollars okay and it's been growing about six seven percent compound for a long period of time but remember that number. Um, the number that Austrade gave us um, for back in, in May this year, it had fallen to about 83 billion. And they did give us that because it leaked to the, the Fairfax papers. Um, but the number's now probably well into the, the probably the 70s at the moment. They're doing a recut of it at the moment as we speak. So my point is, and we raised this at the Senate inquiry, the industry is halved in value in, in uh, nine months. which is pretty bad. <laughs> but, but what it also says to me is that bounce back so please keep that in mind the other uh, key fact to keep in mind is that um, up until recently Australians basically put about eight percent of their household income into in the travel um, so whatever it happens to be so and, and even though real wages we get political real wages have been pretty flat for the last five or six years once we've got a job at the moment um, the point is they were flat and that people have been investing more in in travel and tourism so it's, it's a growth industry the trouble is it's sucking at the moment pretty badly. So in terms of COVID clean, look, I think what we're going to see is I think mass travel is going to be very difficult in the short term. Um, it will come back, but it's going to come back very slowly. So IATA, the international airline body, is saying it's 2024 until we get back to pre-COVID condition a year from 2023 to 2024 in the last couple of months. And I've got one of my best mates is an economist, and he reckons you might as well just throw darts at the board because no one really knows what's going on. But confidence is a funny thing, and I think it will catch on. Um, you're going to see people wearing a lot of masks in travelling, um, but what you in, in terms of air travel, but also other travel, and I think that's a good thing. I think the other important thing you're going to see is that the industry's equipped and ready and is really prepared for COVID, for co post COVID. So, um, I mean, our organisation, without much of a plug, I mean, we've got uh, modules through our national accreditation programs, we're in COVID clean and compliance with state and territory arrangements, as well as what's happening in terms of through Safe Work Australia. Um, so everyone's going to try really hard at this, but I think it's going to, we're going to need it to be promoted, not so much the programs, um, be it through branding, but around that you can travel in a, in a COVID in a relatively clean way. You're just going to have to do it in a different way and you're just going to have to it, it, you know, acknowledge distancing and the like. So, um, but in doing terms of doing it en masse, 
I think it's going to be a bit tricky. So I think the big challenge for Australia from a tourism perspective, particularly tourism, but also domestic, uh, is that uh, will the numbers come back the way they once were? Uh, Long haul travel into this country out of Asia, but particularly North America and Europe, is not an easy sell. Um, to be sat on a plane for anywhere between 12 to 20 hours and I, I work for the aviation industry for a long time. It's not the issue about the cleanliness of the air on board. It's the cleanliness of the people that are on that plane and whether or not they've passed their tests or how relatively clean they, they really are. Or in fact, are the tests purely screening everybody? But there's a lot of tech out there. So the other, my other message about mass travel and COVID clean is that the tech, we've got to back the tech, be it you know, QR codes embedded in cards, whether it's a health passport for one of a word, whether it's a, it's a passageway in terms of the different levels of clearances that you need to travel. But what one thing that just close out, the one thing that has to happen for travel to come back in a mass way is you can't have lockdowns of up to 14 days if you go to another destination because mm. why would you bother? So that's that. Thank you, Simon. And moving on to you, Michelle, from your research of tourism operators in Australia and New Zealand, what can we learn together about the importance of behind the scenes groundwork and how should businesses look at operating once these travel borders are open? Yeah, it's a really good question. And yeah, as Simon <laughs> said, it's a really tough industry to be in. But there's, yeah, for those who know me, I'm a, I'm a big advocate for getting your product right from the beginning and obviously working product for a while. Um, well, for most of my career, I've seen so many different approaches. Um, but when else have we seen borders close? Like technically tourism's illegal and for some state borders, you can't even cross them without a permit. Um, for international borders, you know, you can't travel, like you couldn't travel and you still can't really. Um, but now is the perfect time and I hate to say it, but reset and really relook at your product. Uh, a lot of business I talk to now are almost busier um, without having customers. They're relooking at their business model, their goals and branding. Uh, they're planning for what, um, they want their businesses to look like in a post-COVID world. Um, and I could talk all day about the importance of product development, um, but there is, um, yeah, there's so much you can do to really sort of nail, nail it for when people are starting to travel again. And the other really important groundwork is maintaining customer engagement. So keep engaged with your customers. If you don't engage them, someone else will. Um, and it's more important than ever to keep your brand top of mind so that when the customer goes through that journey, they think of your name. So people are still in that dreaming phase of the booking cycle. Um, so you want to make sure you're on top of mind. And they also want to hear stories. I think businesses are engaging them with stories appropriate for the time. So not talking at them, but giving them things that they can actually enjoy. Like something like the Phillip Island Penguin Parade. Like it's an absolute hit and it's had worldwide coverage. It's all over social media. Um, Tourism Vanuatu is doing guided meditation. There's city guided tours. Um, some of these virtual experiences are so creative and perfect for people who have some time on their hands, which especially in Victoria are a lot of us, um, but getting people involved in your product. So they'll get excited about it. So it's all about getting that enthusiasm out there. Um, uh, the other thing too is just, uh, yeah, blasting deals at them. Uh, travels are not deal orientated at the moment, uh, but they do want value. So considering adding a value proposition to your prices, something that they wouldn't have necessarily gotten before um, or partnering with other operators to combine that value. So you're attracting customers from both sides and you've potentially got two businesses targeting that customer as well. So you're adding, adding value. Um, in terms of, of like opening back up, um, you know, as Simon said too, there's, there's a few key focuses of what travellers are going to be looking for and the health and safety is going to be such an important factor. Um, there's a lot of research around which backs up that people are ready to travel, but they want to travel safely and healthily. Um, and our businesses that they're going to be traveling to are taking pre precautions to actually prevent that spread. Um, we've seen how easily it can spread with this second wave in Melbourne and people are going to want reassurance that your business is actually safe or businesses that they're tra traveling to are safe. Um, above and beyond to make sure they're safe um, when people from different states and cities and regional areas are all mixing. 
Um, ATEC's got a COVID ready program. There's uh, guidelines with the Department of Health. Um, but yeah, communi and communicating these uh, through to the customers is just as important. They need to have that confidence that you're doing what you can do for them to be safe. Um, and then the other one, main, main one is customer confidence. So there's a lot of reports out there that booking numbers and spend drop off, off when the positive cases are high. Um, and there's also been a couple of waves that have proven that trend. Uh, but borders opening are also a hot, hot topic as well. Um, and what we as an industry can do about that is giving that customer confidence that if they do book and can't travel, that we will do the right thing by them or the business will do the right thing by them. Um, but again, communicating that to them so they're aware of it. Um, and lastly, yeah, just keeping engaged, the positive stories, that's probably, yeah, everyone just loves a good news story. So. I really like that, Michelle. I got, if there were three key things, reset, communicate and, uh, and engage, like stay engaged, don't yeah. use hibernation to sit mm. back and stay quiet. Yeah. Um, really good stuff. Simon, back to you. So TA, Tourism Australia 2020 strategy yep. hasn't quite gone as planned, like any of our strategies haven't gone to plan. What recommendations in your experience would you have for an upcoming 2030 strategies based on the current conditions of Australian tourism right now? Yeah, no stress. And look, um, look, 20, that's one people have developed 2020, but uh, it actually, a lot of it actually came to, came to, came about and actually delivered really well up until about um, towards the end of 2019. And then it was like a really good race source was just going to clip away in that last furlong and then um, I have to I follow the GGs a bit, but, uh, and then it just, it all fell in a heap, obviously with the firestorms uh, and obviously COVID. So I'm um, just for the numbers, I just rechecked them again. So we actually got the, the stretch, which was always the controversial thing about 2020 was around creating a, basically doubling overnight business, particularly and internationally together with it. So they taking it from X and X plus X to X basically. And uh, so we got it, and we, we, at the time, very controversially back in 2011, developed a stretch target of up to 140 to 145 billion um, a year in overnight business spending, which most people just fell over and laughed. But, but we then, so we built the target back, so it had between 115 and 140. Um, in a nutshell, we got to about 131, 132. So did pretty well in the end, which is well above the, the bottom end of the stretch and it almost got to the top, um, you know, just with a few billion between friends, didn't quite get there, but it's a very good outcome. Um, the issue uh, with it though, it was, it, was, it, was hyped, it was hyped by China. So the China numbers are obviously were very strong and big, big value proposition around those Chinese, Chinese visitors. So um, if China didn't come in as hard as it did, it would have been a, a lower number. But, but what happened in the back end of the decade, the domestic side actually came in really strong. So, so domestic tourism was at about 110 billion um, out of the 150 billion visitor economy uh, by the end of 2019. So we sort of Australian domestic travel found its mojo again a little bit. So, so that's all good. Um, so what did go well? It was driven as, as, as and I think important with this strategy, and I've. You probably heard me talk about this publicly through various other fora, including media and the like, is that we do need a longer term strategy. So I'll come to 2020, 2030 in a tick. But I think what 2020 did well is it got state, it got governments, federal and state and, and tourism organisations on the same page, set some targets and realistically work towards them. And importantly, I thought put some rigour um, around the um, around tourism, which there was some criticisms of tourism that was a bit of a happy-go-lucky, wasn't really a serious industry. Well, it employs one in, arguably one in 12 Australians, so it's pretty serious. Um, so I thought all that was really good. What it didn't do so well, though, on reflection, is that over the years, it, it wasn't championed properly inside government, um, particularly the federal government, um, interestingly, and even I can say this controversially, I don't think it was championed enough inside Tourism Australia towards the end. Um, um, and I'm happy to say that because I think, in a way, it, it, it's lost its way a little bit, uh, partly because the numbers were so good that it, its purpose, it sort of lost its meaning, if that makes sense. So in a way, we're always going to hit most of the targets. So on, on air access, visitation numbers, China, China was off the, off the charts, all this sort of stuff. Um, and, um, and, but, and what it also didn't do was a couple of the hard ones, like we called it labour and skills, um, that was a really tricky one. I mean, a Labor government bought in 2020 and obviously had some challenges at the edges of it. Um, but on the other side of it, 
even the coalition did want to go and touch areas of labour and skills. And that's, you know, getting skilled labour into different parts of the country, having enough baristas or chefs and all that sort of stuff in different parts of the country, let alone people to make beds and the like. Um, as you know, with a lot of the resorts off the islands, it's not the easiest, easiest um, sort of roles to fill. So in terms of 2030, um, look, it's actually been deferred um, by the government. I'm, I'm, you know, we, I'm a bit disappointed by that. I think they should be pushing on even if there's a shorter term vision, um, get it. I mean, we're in COVID, we get it. Um, but I think industry's crying out um, for a bit of a realignment around and a reset around where we're at and where we're going to go. So, but I think what we could do um, to keep that level of positivity, which and Michelle alluded to in particular, was around um, getting some um, positivity and reimagining um, the industry and reimagining where it's going to be. And it's going to be a different industry for us, right? Uh, and, um, you know, for people selling outbound, it, it's going to be very hard for a while. For people selling inbound, it's going to be very hard for a while. I think selling intrastate day trips is going to be a lot easier. Uh, and some of the interstate markets, depending on the air access, are going to be a bit hard to sell. So I think it's important. And I also think, uh, uh, you know, reimagine that even short-term strategy provides some opportunities to get some role definition for, I'm uh, not just, I mean, TA do a great job. I mean, I'm very passionate about TA, but around role definitions around the state and the feds around what we need to do on tourism infrastructure, importantly, some budget budget spending and some targets around the budgetary process so that industry gets its fair share of the, of the dollars coming out of it. Thank you so much, Simon. And the question that we have for all of you now, uh, is now the time to shift business structure and focus sustainability and acting more responsibly or should should businesses be concentrating on getting back on their feet? That fine line between the two when we're using this time to reset, but where should the focus go? Yeah, I can jump in on that one. Um, survival, I think survival is definitely important, but it's also about setting your brand up for when you do come back is just as important. So. Um, if you want to be seen as a more sustainable operation, then now is the time to be solidifying that in people's minds while you've got them engaged and you're engaging them. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it, it doesn't have to necessarily cost a lot to be sustainable. And in fact, most times it can actually save you money. But now is the time to be exploring those options, essentially. Anyone else have anything to add to that one? Yeah, look, I'd, I'd agree. Um, I think it's important. I mean, look, survival's critical, obviously. <laughs> you can't financially keep, keep the doors open. Um, well, you don't have a business, but um, you've got to be you've got to be seen to be sustainable and you've got to be acting acting in a sustainable way. And that actually does include some of those key principles around, um, you know, your environmental, your environmental responsibility and your social responsibility and your social licence. I think... Um, I mean, one of the big two sort of observations I've sort of taken out of this year was one, I think the penny drops for the average mum and dad that the visitor economy is pretty integrated. So when all the, all the communities got wiped out by fire or impacted by fire, then all of a sudden no one went away on January school holidays. I think sort of people sort of started to wake up and go, oh, yeah, it's all kind of gluey. It's, mm. sort of, you know, all kind of works. And I think that's been a good way to re-emphasise um, the visitor economy. I think the other thing, though, is... Through COVID and this silly debate we're having about borders now, um, I know the international borders are much bigger issue, but the, the domestic borders, I mean, the issue is just, it's, it's actually quite silly. Um, and I've been quoted on this, so I don't care really anymore. Just, uh, <laughs> just say uh, it. Uh, <laughs> so it really is. is. <laughs> yeah, it's just the trouble. I mean, the trouble is it, it's a, it's a $100 billion yeah. decision, right? So we can all, and, and, and TRA came out today, so it's a bit of like fly, fly with somewhat of a flamethrower now. So it's, it's it's basically we're in round, as a rounding area. It's about sixty billion impact of having the borders closed now. So it's obviously a significant impact, and we've got to get somewhere on this at some point sooner or later. Which is around how we COVID COVID travel, COVID safe travel. How do we start to start to do it? And we've got to. And the only way you're going to do it is by starting to demonstrate it, and and then that delivers confidence. So it's a it's a difficult one, but um, it's only as difficult as the fact is. Um, politicians keep saying keep saying they, they, um, they don't listen to polls but they do and then media keeps saying it's polls um, which say that border closures are, are, are a good idea and that sort of stuff so one reads the other and I work for politicians for a few years so they're not all bad people but they do listen a lot to what people tell them a lot so I guess what I'm saying is as an industry we're going to get stuck collectively on the one voice on borders and be quite consistent about it and start telling that human the human story um, I mean probably we've gone on about the economics too much we've got to start telling about the human 
human story because it's just it's just it's silly and we're just going to not have much of an industry left if if it goes for another three to six months so oh that's right and to attest to that it fighting when it's not clear you know when it's not clear when you can operate all the parameters of where you can operate in a covid safe world so as a hot air balloon business post lockdown one we can't social distance in a basket so we had to really take a lot of initiative and put ourselves out there and uh and and uh do with you know with doing all the right things and safety in checks in measures and letting people mm. know all the right authorities what great we're doing example, this but, that's yeah. a great example like so there's a lot of um followers and uh, a lot of them have the bench seats down the, the side so and the trouble is industry actually knows how to fix these things and actually uh, i won't name drop all the different authorities but long story short the authorities basically said to the industry, how do you actually make this work? Because we could put a rule on you, but we don't think it'll work. And they, because the original premise was you've got to have half the amount of people in the in the floor drive than you used to, and the business model needs basically 80% for the work, right? So obviously it wasn't going to work. And all they did was fiddle around a bit with the seating configuration. They came up with better a better seating arrangement, basically a level of social distancing. Um, and the authority ticked off on it. But if, if they let, left it to the authority to make the decision, the, the tours wouldn't have even been operating. And I, the Grand Balloon is the same thing. People will want to get on with it. They just want to know how the business is going to apply um, the processes around the stuff like ballooning, which is a wonderful thing to do. But, yeah, you're, you're pretty close to each other. When you're yeah, that's and, right. And developing new product, to your point, Michelle, you know, new product and new I, innovations came out of that because now we suddenly have small groups and families yeah. and same household go and, you know, enjoy an experience together. It's amazing and what you've got to do when you have to, have to adapt. Yes, yes, that's right. Now, tourism, hospitality, events, another big one that's been impacted heavily now garth with your experience and in your experience how do you envisage events being set up and operating safely when they can recommence in person and further to that will operations differ significantly between small capacity and large attendance numbers when they are able to resume okay, yeah well um one of the roles i do play is a safety officer a public safety officer um, generally appointed for large events and so I've started to put my hat on and started to do a lot of research and see how it's all unfolding, looking at videos of people in sort of cow paddocks in um, since that video has gone around of people at a concert and they're sort of like in a cow pen, I think it is, and um, to people in cars watching DJs playing music, to um, even to some funny memes of people in uh, roped off in four by four square metres and dancing, so just getting a broad spectrum of what's happening out there so basically i have no clue what's going to happen but so i've really just got to bring it to my own practice and what i'm trying to do um so I, last year one of the festivals i work on is esoteric but one of the last events to actually happen a large-scale event to actually happen and they wanted to introduce a pool and i went oh you've got to be kidding I'm, i don't want to put a pool in you know there's people partying and they're the going to want to swim and it's just going to get messy and I, no i don't want to do it you know i just i don't want to have but with any sort of risk um, okay, let's sit down. Let's talk to our stakeholders. What is everyone's needs? Council? Okay, it can't be bigger than a certain size and it can't have a certain depth. Okay, we'll do that. What else? Security? What, what, what issues do you see? Lifeguards? What issues do you see? And then we have that consultation process where we, we all talk about it. All the stakeholders are happy. First aid, what do you want to see? Okay, well, if there's going to be a pool there, we're going to have to bring certain equipment and so forth. Um, and so we all agree that this is how we're going to move forward. We implement um, um, what we agree on. Um, we monitor it. We put some cameras on there, put security guards, and we closed it off at night. So we've only been during the day. Um, we had meetings um, regularly during the day to see if there was an issue. One of the issues, one of the security guards got a bit too relaxed and actually fell asleep on watch. Um, <laughs> so, okay, so we need two security guards. Um, the the, the safety. Um, the lifeguard um, was too much for one lifeguard, especially on hot days, um, minimal shade, and so we re realised we needed two lifeguards. Um, at the end of that, we evaluated and then we'll put some more processes and plans to make the pool safer. So that's no different to COVID. Um, the same process is um, we'll speak to the authorities, they're going to tell us what they require, 
and then we'll go through the same process again. But instead of it being a pore, it's now it's going to be an infectious disease. And how do we manage that? And how do we work with that? Um, for a festival, um, there's big money involved. Um, and so it's the fear there is, well, do I even bother operating? Because I don't know if I can run. Um, our insurance goes and our insurance company is going to cover us because of that. Well, um, maybe we should wait for 2022 before we think about doing big festivals like that. The smaller festivals, um, you know, I run workshops. Um, we went online, and as soon as we're allowed to go, we'll, 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 happen, we'll go straight away based on the venue, saying this is what we require. We can only have X amount of people in a certain area, and we just abide by it. Um, I also run nightclubs. Um, generally, my clubs are about between 200 and 1,000, depending on what I run. And I won't be running any nightclub events until it's completely back to normal. There's no point because that type of atmosphere is about being together and pretty much being on top of each other. And so if we can't have that, then there's no point in me running that at this stage. So that's how I sort of set it. Yeah, excellent. It's interesting that how many events, risk or tourism businesses, how many of them would have prevent infectious disease in the risk management plan pre-COVID. It's not something that was just, uh, um, yeah, the, it, it's going to be, um, the world has definitely changed. Now, Mr. Simon, before you have to head off, to inspire the young leaders that have joined us uh, this evening, now could be the time to allow fresh new ideas from our young leaders in tourism, what path could this see the industry had head down as we recover? Yeah, thank you. Um, I sort of answered some of this before, but I, I, I'll sort of re reflect on a few things and um, I'll put a couple of points out there. I, I'm a bit worried about the social license of our industry at the moment, to be honest, because I think, um, I think there's a bit of a view that some parts of this country and some parts of the world actually don't really want tourism. So, and travel, I think, in a way, you know, they, I would, I didn't, didn't think the world was over travelled, but certainly some pockets of the world were. And you know, those images, there's a couple of images that sort of stick with me pre-COVID. One was the um, was the climb up Everest, and um, the climbers go walking over a couple of those dead bodies and that sort of stuff. And um, you know, and there's some other other shots in Venice and that sort of stuff. So, I mean, the thing is, Australia isn't like that. Um, oh God, I hope it never gets like that. But certainly. We're not like that just in terms of the volumes of people. But I think we do have a social licence issue because I think there's many communities, particularly in the regions and the rural areas, who, quite frankly, have been really happy that the virus has barely touched them and they don't want to get it. So, because of all the scary stories they've heard and obviously in Victoria you get locked down. So, I think that's one thing that we do need to work at as individuals as well well as in groups and so forth is to talk about the positivities of our industry. And some of it is economic. It's... No, your facts, you know, basically one in 12 Australians are uh, directly or indirectly employed in this industry, you know, it's, um, it's probably one of the top four or five industries for our country moving forward. It's, um, you know, pretty much every Australian will probably do some type of hospitality or some type of role as part of their journey through life. Um, you may well meet your life partner out there, a whole bunch of different things. I just think we don't talk enough about that. And I think we do, because if, if we don't talk our own book, others won't. And I'm personally getting a little bit over people starting to talk our book a little bit at times. Um, I think the reimagining thing I think is really important. At the moment, we're reimagining destinations and how we get back to them. But I think we do need to reimagine what the industry is going to look like. I think without sounding too, too down about all this, I do think we're going to be a much smaller industry for a while. Um, and Garth's spot on about events and gatherings of people. I, I mean, I've got mates that own pubs. I bugger it, I don't know when they're going to start opening up again properly in Victoria. I know they're sort of opening other parts of the country now, but, um, you know, let alone run an iClub, I, I don't know how you can pull that off. Um, so, in, in sustainably over time again. So, I just think we're going to be different. And look, I think the other thing to keep in mind is that don't expect business, people travelling for business, if you can call it that, be it on their own pocket or through their company or through the corporate dollar or whatever. Don't expect them all to get back on planes and start travelling again. I mean, I... I this is the one thing I'm really worried about, actually, because we actually, we call it, we, we counted in the tourism numbers, but the reality is people zipping up and back between Sydney and Melbourne for a few meetings, um, or even a meeting, which Jesus, I've done that many times, just to go up one meeting, is you, um, that's counted in the tourism numbers. Now, if those, those numbers start to fall away, 
um, in terms of the people doing it. The, the Qantas, if they can get properly back on their feet again, aren't going to put the amount of services on. I mean, they only put flights on to meet the demand. So um, whether I bet anyone else can be sustainable in that market. So it's a big issue. And the problem you've got to think about is we do need the business traveller to go again because it's not just the CBD hotel rooms and the events and and maybe wander up in one of Garth's events at some point uh, during the night if they've had a long day at, at, the com- at the convention. But my point is that actually helps the leisure, the leisure side of things as well because the biggest leisure airline in Australia was always Qantas. They had a lot more leisure seats than people realising it. They obviously catered for the business market as well. So I think they're probably um, a few. Um, I could get quite boring about the Fair Work Act and working holiday maker reforms. It's been doing a bit of work on that, but... Uh, <laughs> I think that might do. <laughs> I like that. There's a question that's popped up. Thank you, Hugh. Has Zoom killed? Has Zoom killed business travel? Uh, yeah, has it has until up. has until 2021, or maybe in Garth's world, 2022. I I, I think mm. it's it's put it off for a while. I mean, Zoom's become very very effective means of communicating, and um, the difficulty is you, if, in larger companies, it'll be the procurement will just go it's going to save a lot of money not to be moving people by plane. And if you can do it on a Zoom, do it on a Zoom. And um, so we're just, in time, people will need to get over this. But um, I don't see it in the short to medium term. I really don't. So uh, 97% of the domestic aviation industry is down in Australia. 97%. That includes the people that are getting shuffled around coming into the COVID hotels. So it's pretty depressing. We've got to look at the, yeah, we've got to keep talking about it and keep finding I'm bloody, I'm a very positive person, but I'm yeah, just saying yeah, it's, it is, be, but it is what it is, it is, it is, that's a 97, that's a big number of how we've be been, realistic, yeah, you know. we've been, oh, absolutely, mm-hmm. look, that's right, we, um, it's, um, yeah, it, it, it's, right now, it's, it's not too, looking very, very good. Uh, thank you so much, Simon, for your contribution and being here. Um, just to uh, acknowledge your, your time and invaluable uh, yeah, insights that you've brought to the, the conversation. And moving on to yourself, Michelle, and your work around sustainability and product development. How can new products be developed around sustainability with, who may not have that already in place in a business? And further to that, incentive for businesses to be sustainable in the future and using this time of reset to look at their sustainability and um and long and short term risks and benefits to that could you talk to that a little bit like is this the yeah. time to really put that in a, a you know a, on, yeah. a, on a priority list yeah so there's a few parts to that question so i'll, I'll break it down break to it the down. Um, individual parts but um yeah, there's been, look, there's been a lot of talk around sustainability and how businesses can operate once they are allowed to operate again. Um, you know, there's definitely a focus, a focus on it from a broad range of businesses, which, you know, we've seen recently and earlier on in the COVID sort of journey as such. Um, Ecotourism Australia have created a whole new, um, new a, a, a sustainable destination certificate. Um, New Caledonia are working on an ethical charter for travellers, asking visitors to respect their environment and cultures. Intrepid have shared their animal welfare policy toolkit for other businesses to utilise. Um, New Zealand have a tourism sustainability commitment plan. Um, so there's, yeah, there's a lot out there that have been around since COVID. Um, but yeah, product development and around sustainability definitely <laughs> takes more work and I can definitely attest to that, but it's really thinking about each component of your product. Um, not, and it's not much different to um, customer centric product development where your product is developed around the customer needs. Um, you know, whether you're a tour operator, accommodation provider, an attraction, um, every business has a product that they're selling to a consumer. So it just needs to be another element in that thought process of the development of that product. Um, Like when I'm developing product, I always list out the goals for what I want to achieve with that product at the end. So that when, so I can keep referring back to it so that when I do get to that end goal, um, I can really make sure I've ticked all the boxes along the way. Um, And sustainability is just one one part of that essentially. but the first step is to really decide on that you're going to commit to being sustainable. It does take a commitment. Um, and then you have to go back to why you actually started it. So 
Um, and then second is to really brainstorm what you can do. So get your team together, get everyone excited about it, ask everyone, ideas can feed off each other. I'm a big fan of collaborative design and ideas. And you, know, you start off with one idea here and you build on it and you end up with an amazing idea with that collaboration. Um, and it also engages everyone to participate and then live by it within the business. So, um, and then you make sure you solidify that plan of attack um, and making it achievable. And then third really is just to build that sustainability into your branding, um, making sure it's part of who you are. Um, as corny as it sounds, like hanging your hat on it. So it doesn't, you don't need to reinvent your wheel, but making it part of that language and conversation that you have with your travelers or customers. Um, but my biggest piece of advice with that is that you can't be everything to everyone. So when products try and do everything, they lose focus on what they're really good at. So you've got to stay true to what your product and your morals and values and be authentic in that product offering. Um, in terms of the incentives, uh, I'd say the biggest one would be knowing that you're doing the right thing for the environment. Um, you know, back in late Feb, I think it was, or early March, I was looking at a map which showed the pollution density over China and then compared to side by side and then compared to one month prior, the difference was completely night and day. You couldn't even see the country for the red, um, for all the red which was on the month prior. Um, and I'm not saying that should be the norm or that's what we're aiming for is to have no red essentially of pollution. Um, but it is possible to reduce that pollution and travel can be a big part of that um, by traveling sustainably and thinking about what we're doing when we're traveling. Um, most people think that if it's, if you've got to be sustainable, it's going to cost more, but it's actually opposite in most cases, like something small, like turning off lights, you know, having motion sensors in your offices, you know, plastic water bottles costs, like having free tap water accessible, reusing items. Like how often do we buy new items instead of trying to recycle or fix things that we could have fixed? Um, yeah, recycling, it might take extra time, but think of all the waste that you're preventing. Like there's a lot of different ideas around that and i'm a, yeah, again a big fan of that collaboration and you know if you're a local operator engaging with other local operators so you can join initiatives and really sort of team up i guess as a as a goal um, and you can link in with that to share that knowledge um, for like short term i'd say you know there's a, definitely a time investment it takes the time um, but cost would have to be one of the uh, the benefits so and you're also attracting another type of customer that's environmentally conscious. So it's a potentially a different demographic. Um, and everyone's wanting, you know, as Simon said, everyone's everything to go back to normal at some point. But, you know, I think it's really, and you know, that's what should happen, but it's a really good chance to let us think about what our normal for the industry will look like. Um, and yeah, banding together to make these changes possible so that when we do come back, we're coming back as a, you know, how we want the industry to look. Wonderful. Thank you, Michelle. And while we've still got Simon here too, I might just put a question out to to the, the panel here um, because I know particularly for, for businesses, the small tour operator or the small tourism business, small to medium, do you think people's enthusiasm will increase or there'll be a hesitation to kickstart a business that has you know, particularly in Victoria, that has had to um, be suspend, you know, suspend the off, you know, I mean, I know particularly firsthand in our hot air balloon operation, it's going to go back significantly, um, having lost it, you know, you know, a big China was a significant market. What do you think, you know, just, um, Simon, did you have anything to, to kind of um, contribute? That yeah. where you engage with working with different businesses? Yeah, no, it's a good question. And it's like how many how many won't bother, um, particularly in Victoria. I look, there is obviously numbers won't. Um, but I think the vast majority will. I mean, the optimism, the optimism surveys um, that we did of our members across Australia um, and by different states, the level of optimism at the height of the first wave in some states um, was the highest it ever was in terms of looking at the outlook three years out. So... Um, but the, the the reality is, you know, can your business sustain your model in the for the short term, and then obviously that medium term, and how international facing your business was or not. Obviously, the Penguin Parade's been awesome what they've done with the social the social piece, but you know, the vast bulk of their customer base was uh, Chinese, um, and so they they were smashed they were smashed by about week two of February. 
um, or started to get smashed then. So because the, the, obviously the border, the hard border being set up with China and Australia then. So, yeah, it's hard. I actually think a lot of people will start businesses. Um, I mean, the evidence is showing in places like New South Wales um, that actually the number of uh, you know, business registrations has actually gone up a lot. So, and that's partly because of people taking redundancies and I might be setting up a one or two person shop, but they're still doing it. So, um, you know, I think it just depends where you're at. It depends. I would think it would depends on the legacy within the businesses. A lot of tourism SMEs um, are family run. Um, and they've got generations in those businesses. So for them, it's a difficult decision. But if the kids are keen and the parents have had enough, um, you know, they might all, you know, the, the grandkids are ready. You know, it depends where they are in that cycle. I think there could be some good, there could be some opportunities there. But um, I think the other, what Michelle was saying was really interesting. Just just final one for me, just because I've got to go. And I'm sorry, it's been really interesting. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, is... Um, is around the digital, your digital footprint and your digital presence um, for the businesses or the people you work for. So everyone can do, um, everyone can do better on the on the on the digital um, personally and within the firms you work for. And so it's absolutely super serious now. So if your company you work for is not digi savvy enough, make them. Like even the uh, the uh, consultancy I work for, we just had a big debate about our digital just then, and I'm no. I'm not the top of the pops when it comes to our digital savviness in our organisation, but I went to the Digi person and, you know, we swapped ideas and other people have been swapping ideas with her as I found out. So get as digitally savvy as you can because everyone's doing stuff online now. If they weren't before, they're absolutely doing it now. And I think you'll find a lot of customers will come looking at the, looking at the, the tourism offering because particularly if it's a drive offer or it's a, uh, or it's interstate or whatever it is, uh, particularly short to mid-term, looking for something and wanting to, to go out and contribute back to the industry. So, uh, and they're going to look at it online. So if the online's crap, um, it's got to get fixed, right? <laughs> and if the booking engine's not working properly, fix it. And go and ankle tap the boss and say, boss, it's got to be, this has got to be better than this or look at our competitors. And mm-hmm. I just, I've come out of organisations where it's digital's everything and online's everything. And I just think it's just so critical to get that right. It could always be better. So um, I think it's something as younger tourism leaders that you can really, really press. Back in my day, the youngest in the office was the uh, digital and social media guru because they were the youngest, but now everyone's into it. But surprisingly, a lot of companies don't have as great a digital presence as they should. In, um, um, and it's, and it's, it is a bit of investment, but at the same time, it's actually absolutely worth it if that business wants to be sustainable. So. Absolutely. Thank you so, so much. Simon, really, really appreciate it. And move it like with responsibility at events, Garth, uh, just uh, on that topic, is it up to the event organiser to be responsible to enforce their expectations or will the people attending events be the respons- be responsible for their actions? Um, Can you speak a little to that? Where does the responsibility lies around doing the right thing? Is it up to the organiser? Is it up to the people attending the events? Uh, It depends what hat you are um, um, wearing. Um, Legally, it's the organiser, but ultimately it's a relationship between both parties. Um, Hence why I won't run a nightclub until it's all lifted. People are coming to nightclub not to be too responsible. yeah, and so too hard to manage, too hard to control from a compliance point of view and, you know, try and tick all the boxes at the same time. But I also run workshops um, anywhere between six and 30 people. Um, they'll be very responsible. They'll abide to everything because they're coming out to um, learn about themselves or learn about a particular topic. And so they're, they're going to they're gonna play by whatever is asked of them. Um, alcohol, then I've right? got... Um, <laughs> I don't know, they might like, be, but again, <laughs> it's not their primary yeah. purpose when they're going there. Uh, unless it's a workshop and that cocktail, yeah, it's pretty interesting. True. Uh, I'm working on a, an event at the moment um, doing their safety called Looped. It's in, it's, in, it's in September. I'm sorry, trying. it's in Sydney. Um, I'm doing their safety. I sort of just put my hand up as a volunteer when I realised I was going to wipe everything for this year for myself. And I thought, oh, can I volunteer who needs some help? And uh, circular economy is what they're, they're into. And um, it's something I really haven't had any focus myself personally. But my events have some sort of sustainability factor into it. But it's still a bit on my, my, my forefront. So that was a, an event I wanted to learn 
uh, about and get involved in. And that's one of the ways I do learn is to actually work on events that promote a particular cause. Um, and in that case, so we'll be, we've been working as if something's been happening and we're going ahead as normal as if the event's going to happen. And then on Wednesday yesterday, they said, yes, we are going ahead, but we're going to stagger the audience, for example. So we're putting that in place so that people can register, but they register for two hour, hour lots um, to come in. The council approved it, the venue's approved, um, approved it. I've still got to do the safety plan and get my head around how all that works. So I'm going to bury myself in all the legislation in New South Wales, how that works. And so, but we have to take the lead as organisers um, to um, put those little systems in place and then promote it and then hopefully put um, that in place. One of the initiatives might be people walking around with COVID safe high vis vests just as a visibility factor, signs, um, just to encourage because people do forget that they're, they're out talking to friends and they want to talk and that if, it, if it's an engrossing conversation they just naturally will walk closer and closer to each other so it's not on purpose just just the, um, the environment of the conversation they might be having. When it comes to uh, the, the festival side, it's, uh, it's a festival, it's about a 6,000 person event. That's going to be very challenging uh, from uh, keeping people separate. Um, it is a camping festival, so naturally they keep separate when they're camping, but come on that dance floor, it's going to be another issue. You know, how do we do that? We can make the dance floor bigger, actually, and maybe make it the whole field, and, um, but then it loses the atmosphere, so it's, that's going to be more of a a way up whether it's worthwhile and whether we can keep it safe. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, part of the, the dancing experience yeah. is to dance with people. You know, well, I mean, we've done, we've done dance parties online, uh, just doesn't work. You know, me dancing in my room by myself with my disco ball just doesn't, just doesn't feel the same. Um, but we tried it, you know, and that's the thing. But other things, yeah. kind of, and then we've got the other type of events is um, World Vegan Day, which I the event manager for, but I sort of take a bit more side step and more safety officer for that now. Um, probably not going to continue that um, until because that attracts 20,000 people until um, it's very clear what's going to be like to bring large numbers of people. Um, again, that event's more about the atmosphere and a community coming together for one day to celebrate their belief system and taste the amazing food that's on offer and they can bring their friend and they're going to walk around and um, yeah, financially it's going to be too hard and maybe just too hard to keep them separated and having all those stalls as well because it's part of the the theme. Um, so, yeah, so it's, again, every event's going to be different. It's going to be a case by case and then the legislation um, and then the communication around that with the audience and the type of audience that's going to come, whether they'll respect it, but, um, the distancing and all the rules that that's come That's where you it. can see the devastation even in that. You're saying, like, you is an event that attracts 20,000 people, all those storeholders, how that just affects, like the, the flow on effect and the ripple effect of devastation that this uh, has, has caused, that's, um, yeah, it really puts it in an overwhelming perspective um, yeah. in sharing. Thank you, Garth. Um, Michelle, businesses and products likely to bounce back at different rates. And I'm seeing it firsthand. Like mm. I, I, I'm speaking to businesses that are operating almost as per normal. Are the ballooning operators even in other states flourishing and having best months ever? And it's so foreign. We're in the yeah. same country. So this bounce back period, what would you say in and what do you think will rebound easiest or what will be the most popular in the rebound phase that we can all you know just anticipate or have yeah. something to look forward to yeah traveling um 10ks out of our radius would be quite good right now wouldn't it <laughs> like yes. that's what we're looking forward to <laughs> the most an hour? that would help yeah, yeah more than yeah exactly <laughs> small goals small goals yes um yeah look i mean who would have thought states were an actual thing like yes you cross the border and you see the sign and it's um yeah you cross into new south wales you cross into south australia but who would have ever thought that was actually a, there would be a hard line there and i think that's the one of the biggest adjustments i think especially for victorians at the moment but um you know there's i think every day there's reports and data coming out about what's going to come back what people are after and yeah <laughs> as coy, again as coy as it sounds the million dollar question is when states borders are going to open and when are we going to be able to travel overseas um you know we all want to plan and you know as simon was saying it's 
it's so important to have that as a gauge. Um, look, sh short term, I'd say, you know, there's definitely a pent up demand for travel. Like, you know, you just got to speak to friends, not even people in the tourism industry. People would have had, you know, cancelled trips, they've postponed, they haven't been able to see family and friends. Um, people just want to get out. And, you know, I think pending these stage four restrictions with Victoria, you know, what's going to happen to regional Victoria? Like, um, last time, uh, last lockdown, so the stage three lockdown, I was speaking to an operator in regional Victoria and it had opened up and he decided that he wasn't going to open his accommodation because it was too, there was sort of two, phase, two phases to it that he, um, he was, if it was another accommodation in the area and he didn't want to detract from that business as well. So I thought if everyone just puts their energy into one business, then, you know, that business succeeds and it's, uh, you know, be better off. They'd be better off than trying to sort of split revenue between multiple businesses. Uh, but also, his accommodation wasn't quite conducive for social distancing. It was more of a communal. The rooms were quite small, and he had you know communal areas. So there's different ways, I guess, of operating too post COVID, which I've sort of you know we've sort of talked about. But um, you know, regional Victoria are going to be is going to sorry, regional areas and outback are definitely going to be the first ones to to come back. But I think people are really just going to want to reconnect with family and friends. That again, going back to those state borders, how many people know friends and family that are in different states that they haven't been able to see for six months and potentially for six months prior to that? Because you know, if you're visiting someone every six months, so. It, um, yeah, um, in terms of style of trips, I'd say, you know, camping, which, you know, is, <laughs> you were talking about that, um, you know, where people can stay in their own environment or road trips where, um, you know, they'll, they'll be the first sort of type of travellers to come back. But I think there's also a lot of people after that luxury break and looking at the higher end, you know, there's such a broad range of circumstances for people since COVID. Um, some people are working harder than ever, you know, healthcare workers are probably exhausted. There's people have had their hours cut. Some have taken an income hit. Um, but yeah, I think food, wine, um, wellness travel will probably be high up on that sort of list, that sort of luxury higher end stuff as well. Um, people sort of want to treat themselves if they have had that pent up money, I suppose, and they've been able to save. Um, but yeah, also I think people won't be spending what they would have spent on those international trips domestically. Um, they'll potentially spend more than they would have on a normal trip in Australia, um, but not as much as they would have spent on their international trip. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of excess money, I guess, going on people's houses and renovations. There's, um, you know, reports about where that money's going and that's sort of the, the key area. But I do think that there will be people that do want to spend their money once they get out. Um, yeah, regional outback, I think, will be the first point of call, wide open spaces, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, the first lockdown ended, everyone was escaping from the cities. Um, you know, in Queensland at the moment, the outback has been flooded with flooded with visitors. They actually can't get enough staff to accommodate all the, all the visitors sometimes. Like, so I think travel's, yeah, and it's highly seasonal as well. I think school holidays will obviously be still a peak. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, there's definitely, um, yeah, a lot of different ways to look at it, I suppose. And then, you know, longer term with international, I think it's, yeah, I'm not going to make any guesses on it. I think we've just got to wait and see. There's a lot of data out there about what will come first, but I do think it's a bit of a waiting game. Um, there's a few countries that have, um, you know, pro proactively been showing interest in creating that sort of travel bubble with Australia, um, who South Korea, Israel and Greece. Um, which could see direct flights between the countries and quarantine periods wave. But I think New Zealand and South Pacific are probably going to be the most logical. Um, but even that, that's changed in the past couple of, or past month, I, th I think it's been. Um, time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a bit of wait, as I said, waiting game until some decisions are made by the powers that be. And then for domestic travels, I think there's yeah, a lot of research about the travellers um, and what they're going to book, um, but also I think what act, what people actually do when they do go to book um, could be quite different as well. Oh, absolutely. And even like Simon was mentioning earlier already, the, it's already gone, you know, been pushed a year for international from yeah. 2023 20, yeah. to, to 24. And the road trip, right? Like the local, yeah. the local visitor is, um, you know, as a first step is, a, is one to, to really put on a top of mind to attract. Yeah. 
Now, talking about future forecasting, we wish we had a crystal ball. Who knows what's going to happen next week? Um, but, Garth, looking into the future, what do you think events would look like? And with all of these changes to implement and combat COVID restrictions, do you think these are here to stay in the event space? And also to that, what type of innovations do you think we can expect to see? Are you seeing anything new coming in the event space outside of the virtual okay. penguins that have gone crazy? <laughs> Um, again, um, I, I don't have that crystal ball, so I can really only speak from my experience and what my community is creating um, with the workshops, for example. Uh, as I run a men's group. Uh, we've been that for 10 years. We've got about 300 members. We catch up once a month. We do camping retreats, fishing retreats, hunting, whatever. Um, learn, how, learn how to drum, all these different things. And that'll, that'll come back straight away as soon as we're allowed to. Um, but the interesting thing that happened with that and the innovation that happened was that we went online. Instead of doing it monthly, we decided to do it fortnightly. We thought the men needed to have somewhere to talk um, because it could be stressful times and just vent and whatever they needed to do. Um, but what happened with that one was um, people from all of Australia came. It wasn't just Melbourne because we opened it up online and it was Zoom and word got around and people from Sydney, you know, South Australia and Western Australia started coming to the meetings. It's like, oh. Uh, that never thought, never, never crossed my mind that we could actually open up to the whole of Australia. But potentially, we could actually open up to the whole world. Um, the meetings. Um, our mentor is actually from America, and he and he does it between um, Mexico and um, United States. And so, that is going to be an innovation for ours. Is that we're going to continue the online model, um, but we're still going to do the face-to-face -face model as well. So we can, we can open it up to um, interstate people, and maybe international people. Uh, from a nightclub perspective. Definitely not opening, but what again is happening in my community um, because people are deeply passionate about music and dancing and decor and entertainment. Um, what I'm seeing now is all these amazing producers of music is coming out mm. and um, they're writing these amazing tracks. I go, how come you have not shared this with us? And they go, I only wrote it last week. And I go, what? You wrote that in a week? I said, that's dance floor material already, you know? And um, and then a, a, a group in Facebook has started up and I'm looking at all these tracks and going, where has this talent wow. all been? And I'm interviewing him saying, why have you not been doing it? I said, oh, I've been, I want, I've been wanting to do it for 15 years, but I've had a kid, been a mortgage, done all this, but being isolated, now I can write some tracks. And I go, but this is seriously A-grade material because they're DJs, so they, they've been trained to listen to music yeah. and mix music and... Then they just sat in front of the computer. It just happened for them, and it's this is a constant story. I've seen innovation there, like an Australian idol yeah. DJ, like D, DJ music mixing, or yeah, the voice, the DJ, turn your chair, and you could be like the head chair turner. Yeah. So things like that. So we had a meeting on Tuesday. We, you know, I'm going, hold on, there's something happening here that you know we don't really understand, and you know, it's um we have an opportunity to export you know, Melbourne music, once it becomes, you know, there's a community really growing, there's you know, about 80 people producing in one, just a Facebook group, and they're sharing their tracks, and they're exchanging ideas, and that culture's never really happened, everyone's just kept to themselves, and their silos, and there's a on. let me share what I'm doing, and help others, and so that sort of happened, that's, so it's an innovation, in a sense, more social um, collaboration, um, because of the necessity to connect, um, and I can see that, you know, there's going to be a lot of Melbourne music that's going to, going to, going to be out there and people are going to share and people have re rediscovered their passions of what they really want to do and maybe they were in a job that they didn't like. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're, that's an innovation itself. They're reinventing themselves. I know for myself, um, I do safety officing work um, and I was just risk plan after risk plan after risk plan, change it for this event, change it for that event, change it for this event. And then I did this loop festival and I looked and I went, I don't even know what half these words mean anymore, you know. And I went, I've got, I've gone so far away from the Bible, you know, all these years. Let's go back to the WorkSafe guidelines of how to do a safety management plan for a festival. And I start, and then I had to reinvent my my, my own practices. Um, I just got complacent with my own knowledge. I thought, now I'm going to re realign myself back to um, what WorkSafe had to say about managing large festivals. Use the same terminology, follow the same process, do exactly step by step um, what they require. So that's you know that's an innovation my my own self um, to just realign with what the people are saying. Um, what innovations are happening in first aid? Um, 
uh, really again, again hygiene how to keep safe i hope that stays around regardless of covid's um, um year, year to stay or not uh, because i think it's just great that we're a bit more mindful about looking after ourselves um, sanitizing our hands washing our hands keeping our place clean i think it just creates a healthy mindset full stop um, if health can be at the number one forefront of our thoughts all the time um, then you know then the, the side effects are like let's look after the environment as well let's look after myself and i can look after the environment i can look after my friends i can look after my family so these are the sort of innovations that i'm hoping that are going to be coming out because people have had time to reflect on their own personal contribution to the world and their family so um from um, what else i got there um and then i think the thinking local um i think it's gonna be really powerful I think that message is starting to get out now. We are, we are, we've been, we've, I suppose we've, um, t things have been taken away from us in a sense. And so um, um, people are very adaptable. And um, I know I love music, I love dancing. And I, and I said to a friend, no matter what they do, we'll still find a way to do the things we love. And so we did a dance party, but online. Okay, it wasn't the same, but we still try to make it happen. And from that, we'll try to improve it. It's never going to replace the same, but we still try to find a way with the things we love. And I think that's the, the beauty of getting, getting things taken away from us. We get to actually um, get creative with how we can reinvent um, the things that we want to really do. So mm -hmm. that's the sort of the innovation side of things, not necessarily technology and such, but how people are going to interact with the world. Uh, Gav, I love so much about what you've just shared because making a comeback mm -hmm. and how you can help carry the load is also connecting back to self back to making your mm -hmm. own comeback in how are you how are you personally particularly for everyone that's come on board how are you personally using this time to learn something new do something new you're contributing in this men's group something i guess we don't have the time to cover it here but this has been funky this has really gotten some people in a very dark place as well all of this change and disruption and i love that although the human connection has taken taken away from us, we've been able to use technology, even getting in a room together like this, that you're connecting and you're seeing the boundaries, you know, that we're now kind of borderless in the way that we can connect as well, um, that you can see opportunities in the group in the way. And I don't know, I can't see no hands up, but I'm, I'm just putting it in the suggestion box, YTN dance party with Garth at, on the decks. I see it all new, you know, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah, oh, I got I a Boom. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm calling it. Okay. I see it. Post COVID dance party. We all need to get it out. Yeah, yeah. Out of our system. Yeah. Love definitely. Yeah. So uh, uh, as we wrap up in the final uh, question for our evening, um, how do you, so we'll start with you, Michelle, and then for you, uh, Garth, how do you picture your ideal traveller in a COVID safe environment? And how do you see this person will behave in local regions, considering the health of themselves and others and the environment? So just how, how do you see this, this new yeah. style traveller? Yeah, look, I think it's, when I saw this question, I was like, the, the one thing that really stood out to me that I just, it was just being, being respectful. And, and like you've seen when borders did open, like people were, yeah, just not considering social distancing and things like that. And I'm not saying that's why we're in the situation we're in, but it's certainly, you know, not having respect for other people. And this is one of the, the biggest things in my lifetime that I've seen where what other people's actions are having a huge impact on everybody. It's not just affecting you in your action, like your action isn't just affecting you if you're not social distancing. So I think the key, yeah, the key word I come out with is just travel is just being respectful and the areas they're going. I mean, there's a lot of locals in, and yeah, Simon alluded to this too, that in regional areas that they don't want tourists now they want to keep their safe community to themselves and with all, yeah with all due respect i think that's you know that there's reasons behind that but you know there's also yeah tourism employs a huge like it's one of the most labor intensive industries out there and you know to to just say that we don't want tourists because we're afraid of getting sick i think is very um yeah quite scary a scary attitude um but i think yeah to enable that the traveler needs to be respectful for it um you know we've seen yeah some of these areas and 
yeah, locals are just sort of sitting there looking at tourists going, we don't, we don't want you here. But it's about yeah, if I think if everyone is respectful and follows the, the rules and then, you know, that's that's pretty much the, the way of um, coming back from a COVID perspective. And then I suppose from a sustainability perspective, I think it's up to us as an industry to educate the traveller that this is the new way forward. This is what our expectations are. We you're traveling is that you know we're trying to create a more sustainable industry you know, you've seen this is what it was before and this is what we're trying to get to as as an industry um, and for that it really needs to be a collective attitude to um, get everyone's support basically to um, make sure that the traveler is more conscious of it when they are when they are traveling um, but also so that they, yeah, almost accountable that, you know, if, you, if you're seeing someone handing out plastic water bottles, for example, then, you know, they're, they're accountable for that decision that they're making, knowing that it's not the way that the industry is, you know, has set the expectations. How about you, Garth? Is there anything that you wanted to contribute or, or part, you know, any final parting words of your wisdom? Okay, yeah, no, that same word I had was respect. Um, mm. That health and respect, yeah. respect oneself um, and how you hold yourself in the world and how you want to be seen in the world. Um, and then being a respectful consumer. You support those people that are doing the right thing. Um, that's the only way um, the, so let's, I won't say, the, the people that aren't doing the right, that's the only way they survive is because you give them your money. Um, so then spend wisely and, and use, use, um, your money and because that you know that's 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 your vote um mm. how that money is going to get used and then when you are going to go into other place respect that culture whatever that culture is mm. um and if they have laws abide by them you know it's, um, um and if there's certain customs the same principle if you've got mm. certain customers simple as taking your shoes off before you go to the house it's not wrong it's not right it's just their custom respect it and then and walk in gracefully um it's as simple as that and um i don't think nothing's changed from that it's just um we've all had a heightened sense of awareness of um as a global community hey we're, we're actually all in this together and all i have to do if i do my bit then we change the world together yeah i, saw, I agree the, the tourism dollar sorry just to echo your yes. uh, comment got up on the tourism dollar i think everyone's dollar literally is worth a lot more than just a dollar coming post travel so yeah i agree just people thinking about where their dollars are actually going mm. such good stuff guys thank you so much i got a lot of um collective attitude of positive change that this time that we've gone through has has been worth it that we could come out of this with really good that with better humans in in our industry in the world thank you and we've got, i think it's actually it quite is. exciting <laughs> yeah like it's an exciting time to be part of it because there is so much that people have you know yeah I, I mean i'm big on product and innovation but there's so much innovation that's been happening so i think it's a really yeah it's really exciting look with being involved in like a tourism thrive challenge so even something little that we can even do tonight if you haven't if you haven't left a review for a business that you visited that that's making yeah. a difference go back and leave some reviews go and follow some you know show some love to some businesses that they're doing a good job if you if they come across your feed yeah. little things that we can spread some love and light um yeah, yeah. Oh, come positive that. feedback is so, so crucial, crucial so. Excellent. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you all for that dynamic conversation. It's certainly been very interesting to listen to. So it's great to see that we've had a few questions coming in for you. So I'll start off with a question from Hugh Fitzpatrick for Garth. So how will the events sector adapt and will Melbournians ever be able to go back to the MCG to see a footy match with a hundred thousand oh, people. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, it's not, that's not my world. So it's very hard for me to comment. Uh, I know if you go on the MCG website, they are looking for people. Well, they were advertising a little while ago for people to actually come up with a strategy and a plan and be part of a committee of how we're going to get large events back uh, up and running in Australia. I did put my name down, but um, I haven't followed that up. My work load got a bit busy. Um, so, yeah, if you want to find that out, probably um, they're the best people to contact and maybe they can put you in the right um, 
push, push in the right direction. Um, we will find a way eventually. I don't know Melbourneians won't, won't let that happen. We won't. <laughs> we'll figure it out, even if we have to fully mask ourselves or whatever it might be, we're, we're going to make it happen. So. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. So, Michelle, speaking of demographics, Ash Woodrow asks, will we have have to change the way we speak to and market to our key demographics. For example, older Australians um, becoming more digital savvy in the last few months and their sentiment may have also have changed towards travel. Um, so how do we ensure we are talking to them? Yeah, and that's a really good question. And I think, um, yeah, like I know, yeah, th th that age group, especially the older demographic, have, ha have had to adapt. They haven't had a choice. Um, look, I think in terms of changing the, the way we communicate, I think there's definitely, like through any of those sort of digital mediums that where you potentially weren't targeting that audience, that you do need to adapt your language and how you communicate to them. Um, look, I think, you know, webinars are, are gold. Like there's so much that can be achieved with a webinar and, you know, instead of potentially as um, Garth was talking about, like having, you know, you've got a global audience rather than just a, you know, within your town or local area for a conference or things like that. So I think that sort of adjustment can be quite an, a fairly easy change in a way to really make sure that you're reaching your audience um, in an easier way without, you know, having to have something in different states. You could potentially do a webinar after it instead of, a, you know, um, a networking event or not, sorry, networking, but a, um, if you're a tour operator and you've got a conference or things like that. So, but I think in terms of the, um, uh, sorry, the, I was at the market, uh, sorry, I've lost the question. Um, yes. Yeah, so in terms of talking to them, I think just through social media, I think they've definitely become more savvy in social media as well. So just thinking about your different avenues that are possible as well for where they're looking at. So, um, yeah, like Zoom and all that sort of stuff. But there's also other avenues that uh, you can potentially communicate to your traveller through as well. Yeah, nice. So next question from Hayley Fraser can go out to the whole panel. So. Do you think there will be some kind of culture shock between Victoria and other states when the borders open? For instance, from Victoria having a different experience than Queenslanders? Yeah, that's a good one. Well, a little bit of this running joke for a long time. You know, Sydney will definitely be, they'll have one up on us. They'll be able to um, pick on us a bit more now. Um, but uh, we've always had it, so it's just, um, um, we'll, we'll just see how it plays out. Um, but at the same time, it's again, there's also the, the positive side. We've, we've had a deeper opportunity to, to re reflect and understand what's important to us as well. So, and yeah, I, yeah, oh, sorry. Go for it. Yeah, no, I, agree. I yeah, totally agree. I think we've had that more of that time to reflect on that. I think there's definitely a, a lack of understanding like I've got friends in Queensland that had no idea we you know could only go out for an hour a day and we couldn't go further than five kilometers so I think there's a um, yeah misunderstanding about what stage four actually means here and the reality of it but I also think that's us as Victorians are probably yeah not communicating that either and then you know they're not watching the news it's what you're fed by the media so I think there's yeah definitely that that side of it, that lack of understanding. It's not necessarily that they don't care. I think it's just that, yeah, an awareness factor. Um, but yeah, I think the in terms of a culture shock, I would probably say that, yeah, we'll probably be that, yeah, when everyone's sick of traveling and they've all cleared out and they're going, you know, further afield, then, you know, Victorians will come in and um, we'll have the place to ourselves. So, it is. I experienced culture shock today just beaming into a council room in Hayes, New South Wales, <laughs> and they were all sitting around a table comfortably, just, and it's okay. just something we've always used to in a training facilitated space. Um, it looked foreign. It was just, it was, it was quite a, it was something that I had to take like, oh, you can do that. So <laughs> that, it's been so long that I, I experienced that element of culture shock today that, um, oh, so you're allowed, you're allowed to get in a room yeah. together. 
So I think we're going to be a lot more heightened and, and more conscious, like, yeah. like you said, when we are able to travel um, and paranoid to an extent. Yeah. When we, you know, yeah, the mask thing will be interesting as well because we've, you know, we're forced to wear masks, whereas the rest of the states aren't. You know, it's encouraged in certain areas, but for us, it's just become a norm. Like you leave the house, you've got your keys, wallet, mask. Like it's just part of everyday life now. So, I think that's probably the, for me, will be the biggest change as well. That you know, these other states. Oh, don't it's have so to, true. So. Like Haley's just said, you even see people in crowds at footy matches, like the soccer final yeah. was on sunday well, like, what they can do that they're so close to each other and here yeah. we are we we can't even yeah like you said we can't even yeah so it is true it's happening yeah. already the culture shock really <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. This is the yeah. Thing. oh yeah. perfect so our yeah. last two questions we'll send out to you after to answer so Thank you all for sharing your valuable insight with us this evening. And thank you to you all at home for tuning in and joining us. So if you're not already a YTN member, I'd highly recommend signing up to be a part of this amazing community. Another thank you is to our industry partners for making YTN and these events possible. Thanks again for joining us on the Tourism Hub podcast. If you found this podcast valuable, it will mean the world to give us a review on Apple iTunes. We're also live here every Saturday at 2 p.m. across all the Institute of Excellence Facebook and YouTube channels. And you are all invited. Be excellent. And don't forget, we also have courses available at instituteofexcellence.com to help you and your small business greatness.